Stephen Speak, a podcast about everything and nothing. Don't forget to subscribe. Oh, I was air drumming along to that then. I really like the uh, the drums and the big cymbal crash. Oh, enough of me uh, bigging up myself for my uh, intro. Um, <laughs> hello, welcome to Stephen Speak episode number nine. Uh, nine in Roman numerals is IX. There you go. I don't know why. It's Well, I do know why, because it's the I minus... It's the X minus the I. And X is ten. And I is... Or I is one. So it's nine. But there you go, just in case you don't know Roman numerals. Um, it's nine. Episode nine! Anyway. <laughs> um, done my... The previous episode was one of my big loves. And I've left this long enough as well, and uh, like one of my big loves, uh, apart from my obviously beautiful wife, is um, motorcycles, um, brum brum bikes, loud, obnoxious things on two wheels. Um, yeah, I freaking love them. Um, I've been riding a motorcycle, although I don't know if the last couple of years counts, as I've hardly ever been on mine, uh, due to various things, and... Uh, I want to say laziness, but it's not laziness. I'll explain that after. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, I've been riding since I was 19, I think it is. I always forget um, how old I was, but I'm pretty sure I was 19. Yes. Um, yeah, I was 19, yes. I'm just having a debate in my own brain. Um, Yeah, so, obviously, um, motorcycles are considered, like, dangerous and, you know, fast. And I think some people have the view that people that ride them are mental and scary and nuts and put themselves in danger and other road users in danger. And I've heard people say that, and um, I don't think that's the case. Like, having uh, been a biker for... A considerable amount of time. Um, be 20 years this year. Wow. Oh, I'm getting old. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I've got a brew, by the way, so I'm, I'm, my mouth's very dry today. I don't know why. <clears throat> Wet my whistle. Uh, lovely cup of tea. It's very hardcore. Um, I will drink a beer one day, I think, while I record on these to make myself feel a little bit more manly. Um, anyway, um, what was I saying? Uh, motorbikes, yes. Well, I people say that I look like a biker. Like if I say, "Oh, I ride a motorbike," they go, mm, "Yeah, we kind of presume that," uh, which I think is pretty cool. I like that. I don't care that people think that I look like a biker. Um, maybe that means they think I look like a wanker. I don't know, but um, I don't care. Um, but right, I'm gonna go back to the beginning. Like, why I got into motorcycling? Well, my dad used to have one. And I've always, um, I've just always been fascinated with, like, fast things and, and, and vehicles in general. But I was never that bothered about, like, just general cars. Like, for me, a car is to get to A to B. But fancy cars and sports cars and trucks and tanks and, you know, HGVs and so they interest me. And motorcycles for me, I think, because they were a bit edgy and the people that ride them were a little bit dangerous and... Um, Maybe I think I wanted that because I was always quite small and skinny and and I thought maybe that would make me cool. Um, but when it came to the crunch, it was just I didn't like driving a car. And I think that's what pushed me into it. But when I was growing up, obviously, um, I was probably heavily heavily influenced by uh, a couple of films. Um, so you obviously got Top Gun, like him driving, him riding the, uh, the old Kawasaki. Uh, oh, what a bike that is. I was Googling them recently uh, after I saw the new Top Gun film, thinking, could I, could I get a classic Kawasaki? And I found a couple online, and I was like, mm, I was tempted. Um, but, you know, seeing him racing a, a jet fighter taking off, like, it's, it's, it's just amazing. And then him picking up a girl and kissing, you know, she sat backwards on the tank kissing him. Like, as a, as a young lad, you're thinking, when I grow up, I want that 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 thing right there. Um, 
but obviously a lot of films feature bikes. And another thing, there was a, there was a TV show called Street Hawk, and, and not many people remember it, but it was kind of like Knight Rider, but on a motorbike. And I've not seen it for years, so I think it'd probably be terrible, I think, if I watched it. But it was like this. And that was a Kawasaki, actually. I think that was a that was an old Kawasaki that was like the fairing was all stripped off um, to make it look like a, a futuristic bike. But from what my recollection of that TV show was, it was very much like Knight Rider with a bike. Um, but I think one of my biggest influences, and this is so sad and I can't believe I'm admitting this, um, was, uh, Grease 2. So, in Grease 2, and by the way, I don't mind that film, I think it's alright, a lot of people hate it and say it's not as good as Grease and blah 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 blah. Anyway, I was of the age where that was in my kind of, um, I don't know what to say, like, it was like around at the time on TV and stuff quite a lot. Uh, and these are shot on TV quite a lot. And there's there's a scene in that where the guy is quite an intelligent guy. And I, I think this is the thing that really got me. Like, I was quite a swat at school. And he was, like, an English guy in an American school. And I've always loved America and always wanted to go to an American school. I've always loved the American culture. And, yes, slate me as much as you will. I care not. Uh, when I went to America, people thought I was American until I, until I opened my mouth. And then they weirdly think you're Australian. Anyway, um... <laughs> Um, yeah, but he's like a geek, basically, which is like what I still am. Um, and he felt a bit out of place, and he basically wanted to be cool. So, in the film, he buys a motorbike, spoiler alert, he buys a motorbike and does it up, and then learns how to ride it, and then, um, I think they're, I think they're bowling one night, and there's another, there's a gang of bikers, basically, in the film, so he, uh, wants to get one up on them, so they're like, they're like the anti-T-Birds, really, and, um... He shows up on his bike with a black visor, you know, no one knows who he is. And, and there's this song that, that ensues, uh, Who's That Guy? And um, when I do the promo for this, I might, if I remember, I'll, I'll try and see if I can put that song onto the TikTok and Instagram video, because uh, it'll be funny. <coughs> well, I'll laugh anyway. Um, yeah, and I think for me, seeing him go from this the geek to him being on this motorcycle and, and wowing all the women... Uh, all these young girls are like, oh my God, and they're all singing basically, who's that guy? And all the guys are really jealous there. So the girls are going, who's that guy? Where did he come from? Where can I get one? And all the all the guys are basically saying like, we're going to, when we find out who he is, we're going to beat him up and all this sort of crap. And uh, But for me, that really, like really hit home with me. And I was like, oh my God, if I'm a biker, I will get the chicks. And well, that shows how old I am because I'm using the word chicks. Uh, I'm in Greece mindset, so that's why I use that word. Um, yeah, and I think uh, that's kind of where it all sparked from. And when I came of the age where I could like learn to drive a vehicle, etc., um, I've got, I'm, I'm kind of Mr. Captain Sensible, even though I've, everyone kind of has this perceived idea of me that I can be quite wild, and but I, I, I I'm wild within limitations. And uh, when I was looking at riding a motorcycle, a few few guys uh, on the railway road, and they said, well, if you do your car test, it brings your motorbike insurance down. And I'd, I'd checked, you know, what motorbike insurance would be for me on a provisional, even if I did just as a CBT and bought a 125. And, the, like, the, the insurance was heavy. Like, you know, you, you, you were talking, like, well over a £1,000. And I was like, wow, that's that's ridiculous. And I thought, well, if I can, if I can you know... Learn to drive a car first, if that makes a difference. I won't buy a car. I'll learn to drive. Get me get me category B license. And and this is another reason why motorcycles are better, because a car is a category B license and a motorcycle is a category A. Which one's better? You decide. The alphabet wins. A motorcycle. And so I decided to um learn to drive a car. And literally I think I had like four or five lessons. I think it was I imagine it might have been three. It might have been two. I can't remember. It was very, very few, and I hated it. It probably wasn't helped by the guy that was teaching me, I must admit. Uh, he was a bit of an arsehole, and I thought I was actually doing quite well. Like, I'm quite controlled, and I listened to instructions, kind of knew roughly how a car worked, and we were all in driving slowly around near the housing estate where I grew up, and... He literally would just randomly grab the steering wheel for no reason. And I, I know sometimes when you're learning something, you don't understand when you're making a me- mistake. But I wouldn't be drifting, and he would literally just wrench the steering wheel or slam the brakes on, and I'd be like, wow. But then there was times when he probably should have done that, 
And I'd be like, oh my God, and I'd panic. And he would just be like, turn left. And like, I'd nearly crash. I like, mounted the pavement and stuff. Not once did he put the brake on. And, you know, and sometimes I think, uh, like, that's not me being a bad driver, by the way. That's just me just learning. And I'd, I think I accidentally, like, I was dipping the clutch and then ex- pressed the accelerator and then lifted the clutch out, popped the car, and it went, and ran away from itself. Well, I clipped the curb and everything. He wasn't asked. He was like, no worries, carry on. And I was thinking, wow, he, like, you press the brake for no reason, but you don't even react to that. And then there was one time I was turning, I was, I remember, I was turning the left corner and there's this weird junction where there's like a, a right hand bend, but there's like a off, off, right off the corner, there's a left, left turn, but then right next to that, there's another left turn. And there was this little old lady like going across the road and it, she was like, wait, she was like kind of going to step out. And I, I break thinking, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't want to scare her or she, if she's going to step out, I might hit her. And he literally was like, what are you doing? Put your foot down. And he, pre- he like, pressed my leg onto the accelerator and was pulling the steering wheel. To t- and I was like, there's an old lady there. And that, for me, was it. I was like, you can press the brake on me. You can grab the steering wheel. But you can't try and forcibly make me run run pensioners down. So I went home. And I basically told him to stick his lessons up his arse because he got really... I, I was not happy about it. And I pulled up in the house. And he was like, he says... He says, you seem to have a real attitude problem. And I said, are you trying to make me run an old lady over? And he was literally adamant saying, she'd have just got out of the way. And I was like, wow. Uh, so I pretty much told him to, f- <laughs> I pretty much think I told him to go fuck himself and shove his lessons up his arse. And immediately went in the house and phoned up a bike place and um, booked my CBT pretty much. Like within a couple of days, I'd got it booked and, and paid for. And I never really looked back after that. And the day... I got on the bike. I went down. Didn't because I, I was looking at bikes, but I didn't want to. Didn't want to buy one. Um, in fact, I tell a lie. I didn't go in. I went in to book one, and then I thought I, I, I kind of like was going to book it, and I thought, hang on, I haven't even got the money for a motorcycle, so I, I should save up. So what I did was I waited to see how much I could save up. I asked mum and dad actually to go guarantor, and they refused. Well, my mum refused, and then basically told my dad he wasn't allowed to say yes. Because uh, my dad obviously rode a bike and he, he years ago, and he, he kind of wasn't that bothered about me having one, but my mum, obviously, you'll kill yourself, blah, blah, blah. And um, <laughs> uh, you're my baby, you're my youngest son, I don't want you dying on a motorcycle. Um, and I think she thought I'd be mental on it. I don't, I think she had this impression that I was a bit of a wild child. And it's, I think it's, if you're into rock and roll and and you dress a little bit differently, I think there's, there is a very heavy stereotype that you know you do drugs and you drink and and you're mental and you'll you know i don't know uh go off on a wild bender and do crazy stuff and um don't be wrong i've done some stuff in my time but i've never i've never taken drugs and um yeah i'm i am quite reserved i mean nowadays i'm damn right boring compared to what i used to be um which depresses me (laughs) Um, but yeah, but I remember there was actually, there was actually a gap between me. I phoned up to book it and I was like, oh no, I can't, I, I want to be able to ride. Cause basically I found out that your CBT is only valid for so long, then you have to redo it or do your test. So CBT is like your compulsory basic training. It is a joke really. It's literally get on the bike, they show you how to indicate, do a couple of, do a couple of laps of a car park. As soon as they see you basically don't fall off, you're straight onto the road and they just watch you. And if you don't die... Or you don't do anything majorly wrong. That's it. You passed, and you can ride a, up to a one two five. It's changed now, but you can ride. You, you, at the time, you could ride up to a one two five, or I think it was, it was some something like twelve brake horsepower, or I can't remember what the kilowatt kilowatts was. It was like fifteen hundred kilowatts or something like that. Whatever I don't know. Whatever twelve horsepower is in kilowatts, and this that was like the standard. Um, and if you wanted to go above that, then you had to do either the next, you had to do like the next test up, or you could do a direct access, which give you a full license category straight away. And your CBT only lasted, I think it was two years. And if at the end of it, you had to just redo it. Um, but there was no theory test involved. It was just literally this kind of rudimentary uh, practical. Anyway, um, yeah, so I saved up. I phoned up about booking it, didn't book it in the end. Saved a bit of money, then I booked it. And by the time I'd come to do it, I knew I had the money in the bank. So if I was okay on the bike, I could then go and buy one. Uh, and I'd looked at the ones I wanted. I'd, I'd looked around, but in the end, I decided to buy a cruiser because that was that was the style of me, I thought. You know, easy rider kind of thing. Um, sensible. Uh, but I bought, bought a nice bike. And I'd, my, my bike of choice was a, a Honda Shadow VT125. Uh, and I, I ended up putting the accessories on. I put a back stay on it, like a sissy bar kind of thing. And and bags 
and it and it was a lovely bike and it fooled people as well because it was a big v-twin but it was only 125 and i used to pull up places uh, or go or more 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 to the point walk back to my bike and people would be stood looking at it because it was full chrome and and all that sort of stuff and people were like oh that's a lovely bike that is and i'd be like yeah. and it was on l plates and i used to get some bikers come and say hey mate you should be riding that on l plates you should have a test and i'd be like it's a 125 mate and they'd be like no it isn't and i'd be like and I put my key in and I start it and it'd go and they'd be like, oh yeah, fair play, mate, fair play. Uh, still a beautiful bike though, and I went miles on that thing, like really cut my teeth on it. Uh, but anyway, the day of the CBT, it was just like second nature to me getting on that bike. Like I, I borrowed one, I hired one to do my CBT on, and again it was like a cruisery kind of thing. I think it was a Suzuki Marauder, which was the Suzuki's version of the one I bought, but it was only a single cylinder. Um, so it looked a bit shit, to be honest. But yeah, I literally sat on the bike and I thought, you know, this just feels right. And I just took to it and I had no issues. Obviously, I was a little bit nervous going on the road and I'd never done like, I'd never been on something that was like motor powered. Like I'd never, apart from driving, but driving's a completely different experience. Like, um, but yeah, I never looked back after that. And, and I had my VT125 for, for five or six years. I did my test. But I didn't get rid of it. I rode it for quite a while, like probably about, uh, I'll say quite a while, but probably just less than a year. But then, because because I knew then I could buy a bigger bike after I after I'd done me, I did a direct access course, so I was riding. I did it on a on a five hundred cc bike, and um, I ended up buying the similar bike that I did the test on. So I sold my uh, Honda Shadow, and I actually got a really good price on it. To be honest, like um, considering it. It done, not done loads of miles, but it done quite a lot of miles for its age because I, I literally went everywhere and it was my only form of transport. Um, and I'd done a bit of customization to it. I, I decided one day to paint flames on the tank. Not very well, neither I hasten to add. Uh, <laughs> um, but I thought it looked ace. Um, yeah, and I managed to sell that and I actually went to the shop I did my... So I had to renew my CBT because it ran out because I didn't bloody put in for it. And then I rode my bike and then put in for my test. And so I had this, I was riding on a CBT for like four four years and then rode rode on a full license for like a year before I got me CB500. Um, and I've still got that. It's unfortunately a bit of disrepair at the moment, but that's going to be a project bike when I get sorted. Uh, it's going to be a little side project, so there'll probably be podcast updates on, on my terrible mechanic skills. Um, but that bike was ace, and, and that was another workhorse for me. Like, it had enough punch. Again, because I'm Captain Sensible, I could have gone out and bought my dream bike, a CBR 1000 Fire Blade, but I didn't, because I thought, you know what, Steve, you'll probably kill yourself. You're not used to that. And and the CB500 is a bit of a sit-up-and-beg bike. It's good for, you know, getting your head down, a little bit of speed, going around corners. But if you want to sit and, and and cruise, it's perfect. Like, you can eat up five, 500 miles on that, no problem. Um, and, I, and I have. I, that's, the, that's the bike I did my furthest points tour on, which was a charity uh, ride that I did in 2010 to raise money for the Royal British Legion because I was a member of them at the time and, and really heavily involved in the crew branch. And I'm going to do an episode on that for its anniversary in, in uh, July. So uh, it's going to be me reviewing the film that I, I recorded. If I can find it, I've got I've got it on a hard drive somewhere. So uh, it is on YouTube, but bloody silence the whole bloody thing because of copyright and stuff. Really annoying. Anyway, so yeah, I rode the whole country on that in five days. Uh, and it was a bit, I must admit, that was a bit uncomfortable to do like literally two and a half thousand miles, like 500 miles every single day for five days. doesn't sound like that much of a challenge, but you sit on a motorbike for 12 and a half hours. Um, literally, I had like probably half an hour, 40 minutes break every day. And I rode solidly through wind, rain, sun to visit all the compass points of Britain. But anyway, we'll revisit that. Uh, and then... I couldn't, I didn't have the heart to sell it. Like, I literally, when I considered selling it, I cried. Um, I, I have a quite a bond with my bike, so it's, it sounds mental, but um, especially after that trip, like, I would talk to my bike as I was riding. Um, like, I was like, you know, you're doing good, and I'd pat, pat its tank like a horse, like you would talk on a horse's neck. You see, like, riders pat a horse's neck. And um, me and that bike have, after I did that kind of challenge, um, it really bonded me with that bike, and and I absolutely adore it. And that's why it pains me so much to see it in the state that it's in right now. Um, and I I really need to make an effort and get it back into the garage, uh, make some space, and 
get it in there and start start you know restoring it really it, this it's it was going to be a tinkering job but it, it's fun, fundamentally an hour rest- restoration um yeah and then so i decided because i didn't pay, owe anything on that that was my solely my bike so i decided to buy um another bike so my third bike i haven't had that many bikes by the way i've rode a lot of bikes i have test road bikes and i've rode friends bikes and stuff but i'm, I'm I, I don't buy bikes very often for me um for me i find it hassle to change vehicles and i I buy a bike because I like it and I've researched it. So when I buy a bike, I know I'm going to like it. But I'll come back to that in a second because my new bike isn't that case. Isn't the case. Um, <clears throat> but I bought uh, another Honda Shadow, actually. Uh, it was the Honda Shadow uh, 750 Black Spirit. And that was very much like the bike that was in Greece 2. Uh, very throaty. It was a lovely bike, shaft-driven, and had loads of torque. Probably a bit too much torque, actually. Uh, you could wheel skid it and drift around corners. It was insane, and I actually regret selling it. But we were moving house, so I was moving out of my house into, in, you know, and in the interim time before we could buy our new house, my house house was sold. And didn't want to lose a sale, so I actually moved into my, my mother in law's house, and um, I own, I couldn't store both bikes anywhere, and I was already paying for storage of all my stuff, and so I decided to I did, again I couldn't get rid of the five hundred. Again, I contemplated getting rid of both of them, and I, I, I just couldn't. And I, uh, it, I just, yeah, that's why I've still got the five hundred, and I, and I sacrificed the V seven fifty, um, because the money was needed as well. We needed to pay solicitors' bills, and I didn't. I wanted to use as much money for equity to, you know, to invest into the house really. And I wish I'd not sold it. It was a bloody lovely bike. Um, and then, um. So I had my I had my CB five hundred. I didn't ride really for a, for a, a while, like we we because while we were doing the house up, and then as soon as we got into a position, uh, we'd we'd moved in. I think it was why I didn't ride probably for about eighteen months, which killed me. And then Sarah said, "Like you need you need a bike, you need a bike." And I was like, "No, oh, I don't. It's a lot of money." Blah blah blah. I'll get that one going. You're not going to get that one going. It's buggered. Get a bike. So I've always wanted a CB thousand, CBR thousand, um, <clears throat> or a fourteen hundred. Flatbird, but they don't really make them anymore, and I'm quite a short ass, so I've got to really pick my bikes wisely. Um, you'd be surprised, like you know, when you shop for bikes. A seat height is a massive factor. That's probably really why I've gone for like the types of bike I do because they're 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 good for short asses. I'm like I'm five foot seven, but for a lot of the bikes that I like, uh, so I like the I like touring bikes and stuff like that. You have to be slightly taller because they're more of like a an off road kind of style. Um. But I decided not to go for the thousand cc, and I and I ended up buying a new category that they were releasing, which was the CBR six hundred and fifty R. And had a test ride, loved it, loved the speed. You know, felt great. I thought, oh no, this is it. This is the one. And it got it on PCP. It was only eighty quid a month, and I thought, brilliant. I can afford that. And it gets me back on the road, and I hate it. Well, I don't hate it. I don't hate it. Um, I'm so used just to eating up miles. I'm so used to like. You know, waving goodbye to the house and being gone for six hours on the motorbike and coming back, you know, like 300, 400 miles later. Um, I mean, one day on my CB500, I, I got up at like five o'clock in the morning one morning because I couldn't sleep. And I thought, you know, what, I'm going to go for a ride. And I literally packed some water, packed a couple of snacks into my bike and set off. And I was like, I was meant to go, I was meant to be going with my friends. So I think I had it. My brain had it. My brain, my brain had it that I was getting up anyway. But then I couldn't go and visit my friend because something had happened. They had like a family emergency. And then I thought, you know what? I could just bloody ride down there anyway. I don't have to go and see him. Like I could just go and have the ride that I was planning anyway. Because I was planning to ride to him. Cause, again, I think it was before I had a car. So I just got up and went. So I went, I went from like, I live in Cheshire. So I went all the way down to Worcester. Then some places around there. And if I, 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 how I ride, it was like, if I see a road sign, I'm going towards it. Even if it takes me off direction. Uh, and I had a sat nav on, on that bike. Uh, so I knew I knew I was I could always get back to where I was going to if I ever got proper lost, and yeah I just rode and rode and rode and rode and rode, and I end up I went to Worcester and then I went along the M4, and then I went to I'd always wanted to go to Horsell Common because I'm a massive War of the Worlds fan, um so I thought you know I saw it I'm gonna go to Horsell Common and uh, we me and my brother um have been there since as well it's it's. It's cool to see the places that are in the book. Anyway, I went to a few places around there. Then I went to Brighton, because why not? And I was going to stay there overnight, and I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. So then I came back up and went around the M25, and then I came up with the M1, and then, what is it, the M42, and then back to Crew. 
and I literally got back home about eight o'clock at night and I'd done like 750 miles. Bonkers, really. Um, it would kill me now, but it was brilliant. It was glorious sunshine all day. I got a tan. I stayed, I stopped off at uh, services uh, near Silverstone Racetrack. Um, and I remember just sat leaning against my bike, leathers off, because I, I, when it's weather like that, I usually just wear shorts under my leathers. So I literally stripped off in the car park and was just sat with me. You know, leaned against my bike, enjoying the sunshine. Sat there for about twenty minutes, or so, and I actually got, I actually got sunburnt in that twenty minutes. But I am quite white. Um, it's a wonder I actually get sunburnt. Actually, you think that I'd be fully reflective? Um, but yeah, oh, just I love bikes. The feeling you get on a bike is like no other feeling. Like apart from all the dickheads on the road, like they're the only thing that spoil it really. Like, uh, and the quality of the roads actually recently, like in recent years. Um, if we could sort out the way our road tax is used to, to actually make better road services and people open their eyes a bit more. I mean, I know some motorcyclists can be difficult to see and, and, and I must admit, I, I don't really, I don't really like, um, um, what do you call it? When you go down the middle of traffic, oh my God. Um, you know what I mean though? Uh, cause a lot of bikers do that and I, I, I will do that if the traffic's completely stationary and I think it's safe enough to do so. But when you see the traffic moving and, pe- and bikers are going down like the centre line and stuff, you just think, oh, it only takes one person to be turning right into another road or decide to turn around. And I know that person would be kind of at fault, but for me, um, filtering at like 30, 40 miles an hour is, is it's just too dangerous. I've had too many close calls, to be honest. And um, I, I've never never been knocked off a bike touching, touching wood. Um and I hope I never am. Uh, and if I am, I hope I'm not hurt too much and the bike isn't hurt too much. It, it, it's a reality of riding a bike. You know, you're very exposed. And if you do get hit, then injury will ensue. And, and it's just, uh, I think it's by the the grace of God, as they say, whether whether you sustain uh, injuries or not. And um, I have fell off a bike, the CB500. They always say when you when you get on a new bike or you, you go up in size or anything like that to a, to a new type of bike or... If you go up substantially in size, i.e. from a 125 to a 500, um, a lot of bikers told me, you, if you're going to fall off, you'll probably fall off within the first month of having it. And I was like, really? And they went, yeah. And they said, it's normally towards the end of that month. And I was like, why is that? And they went, because you'll get used to it and something will happen and you'll either react to it bad or you won't react or you'll forget what bike you're on. And I was like, hmm, probably not. And then it happened one day, I was coming over uh, a bit of a humpback bridge in crew, and there was a car in front of me, and as I came over, it was like a bit of a blind uh, blind hill kind of thing, blind blind bridge. The guy had stopped to reverse into a one-way street, which was highly illegal, and I touched the back brake, and there was some diesel spilled on the very top of the, very top of the hill, and I skidded, but annoyingly, I actually got the bike completely under control and stopped. And it wasn't when I put my both feet down, my feet must have slipped on the on the diesel as well, or the oil or whatever was on the road. And I just literally fell off my bike. So I was pretty much station I think I was actually stationary and just fell off. And I put my hand my left hand down to, to like steady myself and uh just broke my wrist, which, you know, just to go show, but it was like the force of the bike falling over with me, like broke my wrist. Uh and that's luckily the worst one I've had. I've had some really close calls though. I've had to like basically sideways skid around a car to avoid them. I've had to like do multiple emergency stops and it's one of the first things that I do when I get a new motorbike. I literally practice emergency stops. Um and that sounds really geeky, but I'll I'll go off onto a quiet area and I'll just ride around, get used to how the bike feels, and then I start doing stuff at speed. Um and my CB CBR six fifty R that I've got right now, it's coming up to the end of the, the period and I've got to decide now what I'm going to do. Am I going to privately sell it, give it back, swap it kind of thing, or keep it? And uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to keep it. That's like the option that is out. If I do keep it, it'll be to privately sell it, so pay the finance off and, and, and sell it on. Uh, but I've got to go down and, and look at my next bike. Uh, and I think I'm going to go back to a cruiser, not going to lie. Uh, the Grease 2 fancy is still calling me, and uh, I think I need to need to return. Um but yeah, that's bikes, you know, and I, it's in me. I'll always be a biker. A car is a car for me is always a means to get from A to B, and uh, I think I'll always be be a biker in some capacity. And I really need to get back into it. I think when I when I get my new bike, I'm gonna make it my aim to like I'm, I'm gonna have to put it in the calendar to get out on it so many times, um, like a week or something, or you know, and and especially for Sarah to jump on the back, you know, 
her dad was a massive biker and and it's kind of like in her blood um through him um she has lots of memories of her dad riding motorcycles and and uh yeah and we need to we need to get a new bike that we both can enjoy and and get out there and um yeah but it's just amazing i mean it's not for everyone i know but uh if you know you know and uh yeah and just keep keep an eye out for bikers because you know um they're quite fragile <laughs> remember you've got a big cage around you just look that extra one time because um it's pretty much brown alert time if, if you get pulled you know if someone pulls out on you because depending on the weather conditions you know you sometimes feel there's not much hope <laughs> <laughs> oh, nervous laughter um yeah so thank you very much for listening that's been steven speak and 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 that's my experience with motorbikes and my love of motorbikes and and i hopefully i'm gonna get someone on soon i'm not gonna say too much but I, i'm trying to get some guests and and someone that i'm trying to get on soon is uh big into motorbikes and is famous uh in the world of motorbikes uh, I'm not going to say too much more. I'm not going to say the person's name because I don't want to jinx it. Uh, but by all means, if it gets confirmed, you will see it everywhere. I will promote the hell out of that episode. So thank you for listening, and I will speak to you very soon. You've been listening to Stephen Speak Podcast. I'd appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button.